everybody. So it's a funny thing, but half the time we don't do things because they're the best thing to do. We do them just because we're used to them. These things are a good example. The reason they're like this is because they're like this. And we've been using them for 100 years and we're just used to them. And resistance to change is enormous. The problem with cranks is that when you're at the top, you're pushing straight against the crank. And what you need to do is slide your foot. Otherwise, you lose a tremendous amount of power in that pushing. There was, during the 80s, something called the biocycle, which was an elliptical crank to try to help you overcome that push. But it is still a real issue. And along came these guys to save the day. The singer has a secret weapon, and that secret weapon is the treadle. The treadle takes that push and turns it into a rotary motion. But because you're not pushing straight down, treadles, cranks, can transfer up to five times the torque. Then singer came along, and they brought with them this. It's actually a crank mechanism from their treadle sewing machine, and what it does is it turns that up and down push motion into a rotation. Now this particular machine is uh, the extraordinary penny farthing. Having a crank there means you can put the seat further back and you're less likely to come head over heels over the handlebars. Of course, these things weren't just restricted to sewing machines and bicycles. They found widespread use in the railways where they were used to push a vehicle along, known as pump trolleys or pump carts or jiggers or rail velocipedes, a whole host of names for exactly the same thing. And they came in three or four wheeled versions and were able to carry one person up to a, a huge crowd. Now, in railway terms, they were quite light. In real terms, of course, they were extremely heavy, and that mechanism has been used so often because of its efficiency at transferring power. So given this is supposed to be great for the transmission of power, and it's basically nothing more than a few links and pivots, the next thing I want to do is to see if we can turn it into a way for generating power. So I drew this up in Tinkercad, and it's pretty simple, really. If I print off the disk, which I've got here, and I put a lot of magnets around the edge in a north-south, north-south configuration, and of course the disk sits in that cradle, and that's what we're going to spin. Now the cradle has a couple of 12 millimeter by 6 millimeter by four millimeter bearings. So the holes in the six, uh, sorry, the hole in the center is six millimeters. So it takes a six millimeter piece of steel and it's 12 millimeters on the outside. So we only need four of those bearings, but stick two of them in that cradle, pop that in there with its magnets on. And what I've got here is a bit of six millimeter bar that's going to protrude out once I get it stuck through there. There it is, nice and free to turn. Now, of course, what I want to do is put the cranks on. The cranks are these bits here, and they've got a connecting rod, and in there is where the other bearing goes. And there's two of those, there we go. There's two of them, and they fit on there through that central hole. One thing to note, if that's at top dead centre and you turn it round, the other one is 90 degrees that way, so you fix them in that way. Now I put them on the 6mm bar on a spot of super glue, it's fine for what we're wanting to do. Now we need to attach these, which are the pivot cranks, to here, and they go that way around with the small one facing outward, because this whole lot is going to go in that box. For the pivot on that, what we're using are some pins. These are 10 centimetres long, 2 millimetre pins, and they just go onto that pivot like that. If it's a little bit tight, you may need to drill it out with a 2.5 millimetre drill. And those two pivots go on the back there. So when you've done that, they feed in there like that. This is the pivot pin we're going to use. It's 50 millimeters by two millimeters, and it's going to go through there, which is the point at which it pivots. You'll notice on the side of the box, there are some corresponding holes. Again, if those holes aren't the right size, just drill them out until they are. Okay, and that's it put together. Now, I have to admit, I have a little bit of an obsession with these silly feet. I got them from Thingiverse. They're meant for a 3D printer, but I think they're really cool, and they make everything look really cool. So, I've included them in my Tinkercad files. You don't have to search for them, but if you want to search for them, they're actually just available on Thingiverse. Now, this is all put together. What we get a choice of doing is we can either do that, or we can do that. <laughs> oh, we can do both together. And that obviously will spin this wheel like crazy. And of course, this wheel's got magnets on. It's its own flywheel. And those magnets are in north, south, north, south. So 
We've got a coil and we're going to see if we can get a voltage out of it. Okay, to help me do this, we've got Luke, guest Hello. appearance, and the camera at the meters right here. But I'm going to ask Luke what it is anyway, because I can't see Jack. And what I'm going to do is waggle this, and Luke's going to hold the coil next to the magnet. Shall we go, Matt? Let's do it. One point three. Really? Yeah. Done. One point five. <laughs> Okay, that's pretty, that's really cool. How do you make use of the devices you're making? Because of course we make lots of wind turbines, lots of generators, and my tendency is just to leave it with a couple of wires sticking out there and say, okay, wire it up. And the reason I do that is because the okay, wire it up bit it's always the same. It doesn't actually matter if you've got some really tiny, tiny little project you're doing or some really big project. The process is always the same. Now, all electromagnetic generators, that is generators where you waggle a magnet field around a coil, produce AC. You have to do something with that. And in order to do something with that, the very first stage that you do is rectify it. Now, some DC generators use brushes to pseudo-rectify, but it's never really very good. What you really need to do is stick a rectifier on those two wires coming out. Now, rectifiers can be bought as a package and then bought usually at, oh, I don't know, less than a penny per unit. And use a diode in a diamond arrangement like this and wire them that way and you will get some DC out. Now that DC won't be perfect, it'll still be bouncing around as DC and that's called ripple. You might want to take that out in which case you strap a capacitor in there but let's leave it for a second and just say the first thing we do is rectify it. The very next thing we do is stabilize the voltage because it's extremely rare for you to want a voltage that rises up and down like crazy. What you really want is something nice and level so that you can feed it into a battery or feed it directly into your phone or feed it directly into some kind of application. And for that, you need a nice stable voltage regulator. Voltage regulators are stunningly cheap. I mean, there's five of them in this package and it costs $6.99. And there it is. It's a little circuit board that's just ridiculously cheap to buy. So you can make this from discrete components if you want to, but to be honest, I just think it's a waste of time and that you just get something like this. Now, this is based on the popular chip, the LM2596S. It's a voltage regulation chip. It will take three amps. On the input, it'll take something like, oh, between three and 40 volts coming in. And that's three and 40 volts varying wildly. On the output, it will output something like 1.5 to 3.5 volts. And you can set that to be a voltage between those ranges that you want. Now, three amps is a considerable amount of power. It's, it's more than you're going to use for phone charging, for example. It's more than you're going to use for an awful lot of applications. So it's a very popular little board that's relatively easy to buy and relatively cheap. Now, I'm quite sure that in the comments, people will put their favorite boards and the reasons why it's their favorite. And this is no good because X, Y, and Z. And that's great. It's nice to hear what other people's favorites are. I choose this because it's basically dirt cheap, really easy to use and represents the same whatever. Whatever you do, you take those two wires and you rectify them. Once you've rectified them, you stabilize the voltage with something like this. And something like this is stunningly easy to use. So to help me do this, I've got a power supply set at ton 10 volts and I've got a multimeter that's reading the DC voltage. Because you're going to muck around with these, you should already have a power supply and a multimeter. If you don't, you probably need to get one. I've also got a very tiny screwdriver and I've connected this up. And I know which is in and out because it tells me which is in and out. And I know which is plus and minus because it says plus and minus. So you connect the out to your voltmeter so you can read the out. And you connect your in to your power supply so you can give it the voltage that you want to give it. And this voltage will vary in your actual application, but when you're doing the setting, you do the setting by using a stable supply. Okay, so it's reading 9.46, and that's because of the setting of the factory. Now we're going to twiddle this knob on the top. 
There's a little brass screw right there. You pop a little screwdriver in and give that a turn and watch the voltage. So it's clockwise to increase the voltage setting and anti-clockwise to decrease it. And that is the voltage out. So the voltage out will be stabilized at the setting you just put. And it doesn't matter if this changes its voltage. So let's say 15 volts. And we still get five volts out. So that's how easy something like that is to use. And all we do is we solder it in. And of course it's plus to plus, minus to minus. So on your rectifier, you'll have a plus out. And that goes to the plus in on the voltage regulator. On your rectifier, you'll have a minus out. And that goes to the minus in on your voltage regulator. Then your plus out and minus out will be the bits that you're going to take to whatever application you want, like a battery charger, a phone charger, something like that. We could get it to do better. To get it to do better, we're going to use this. It's a 60 tooth cog. We're going to replace this wheel with this. So it's a straightforward swap over. Now we can use this gear to increase the speed of this. And if we increase the speed of this, we're going to increase the volts that it generates. Now, this is a 60 tooth gear. And here I've got a 20 tooth gear. If I match those up, so we've got the 60 tooth to 20 tooth, we've got a three to one ratio. That means that every time I turn this, once this turns three times. And so we'll get three times the speed out of that. But we will also get three times the torque requirement. So we're going to have to press this harder to make this go faster. But in order to do that, of course, put that gear there, what we need is some way of holding it. So in the Tinkercad file, you'll find this bit. You print that bit off and it goes right there. And you can see that what I've done is I've created a gear chain with the large cog that we replaced interfacing with the small cog. On the same shaft is another large cog interfacing with the small cog. So we get three to one and again three to one. So overall we've got nine to one because the gears multiply as you add them. So for every one movement of this, we'll get nine movements of this. That is every one turn, we get nine turns. And we could keep on going, but that looks like enough. Now, there is a left and right to this. So I've just put the one side on because the other side goes on later to stabilize everything. And I've left it off just so you can see it. Now you might notice a couple of other things. I've put a coil here in preparation for taking some kind of reading and this did snag here. So I put a heat gun on it and bent it out. Clearly I need to change the Tinkercad file so we get this bend in here so that we don't hit the cog but we now put this onto this shaft here and as I say we get nine turns of this for one turn of this we turn this by operating those levers and what we're going to do is see what kind of improvement we've got Okay, I've hooked everything up and I put the meter there so you can see it. I'm not going to be able to see it, so once I've done this, I'll stop and review the video and see what we got. But all I'm going to do is waggle this backwards and forwards, spin that, and we'll see what we get. Now, it's quite big and chunky, but that's because it's made out of plastic, and I worry about it wearing out and the forces snapping the teeth off, so I've made it big. But that gives it a sort of Ruth Goldberg kind of Heath Robinson look, which I personally like. But the principles are going to be the same, whether we make it nice and chunky like this, or we make it out of metal and all these gears are really, really tiny. We're still going to get the same kind of result. So let's waggle this and see what we get from that. Now, I haven't said anything about the length of the axles. They're all six millimeter bar. And that's mostly because I don't really know. I mean, I just give it a go and see. And when I'm half building something, if they stick out a little bit, well, no big whoop. So all I do is cut off a piece of bar. So anywhere between sort of 60, 120 millimeters, roughly. Then I stick it in there. And if it sticks out a little bit, well, I take it apart and saw it down to fit. So there are no lengths to the axles, but all of the axles are six millimeters. All of the bearings are 12 millimeters by six millimeters centers four millimeters deep you can buy those just on Amazon but anyway the details on the construction so first of all we need these parts four feet the cradle the two uprights in gray and the red 
box and we stick all those together like this. Then we need one of these, which is the large cog, the 60 tooth cog. And that goes in the centre of the cradle. The bearings are 12mm by 6mm by 4mm deep. And the axle a piece of 6mm bar. Now we need this, this blue one. And it matters which way around they go. So the blue one attaches to the red box like this. And there's a hole in it so we can get the pins in. And if you notice which way around it's sloping, that's the important bit. When we put that on, we need another 60 tooth cog. That goes in the top hole, as you can see. Then we need one of these smaller cogs, and that slides on the bar of the top big cog. So remember, it's a six millimeter piece of bar going through both of those cogs, and the orange cog engages with the cream cog. Then we need another orange cog, and that goes on the lower part of the arm. Those large holes, again, are the 12mm by 6mm by 4mm bearings. All those bearings are the same size and all of the axles are 6mm. Then we get the opposite side, which slopes in the opposite direction, and that fits onto the reverse side of the red base, and that's what carries the gear train. Now we need the actual magnet arrangement, and in this one we've got a reverse clutch in it, so it's a one-way clutch. And in those indentations is where you glue the magnets. The magnets are all one centimetre by three millimetre circular magnets arranged north, south, north, south, and that goes on to the small cog axle, which sticks through another bearing. Then we have this weird little red piece that's got a little slope in it, and that's to take the um, serpentine coil carrier, and it fits on like that at a slight angle, the angle being the, uh, so it doesn't touch the generating wheel. This is the serpentine coil former. We form the serpentine coil like we've done many times on those blocks. When you're thinking about coils, you're really thinking about Fleming's right hand generator rule, where the movement, current and field of magnets are set at 390 degrees from each other. So when you have movement in one direction and you have a field crossing other, the direction of the current is always going to be given for you and fixed because in a generator the movement's the same way but the field is going north south north south so the field is exchanging so what we effectively want to do is have the current move one way and then the other way we want to join that up somehow so that the net effect is the current moves only one way now we can do that really simply actually we just do that like this You'll notice that the wire goes up one side and down the other side, and so the current moves in the right direction. And a serpentine coil represents that. Massive coil of hair-thin wire, a bit of a wooden board, and two bolts with some rubber over them. And what we do is put the bolts in the board and just wind the coil round and round and then tape it all together. It make more sense when you see it, so let's get on with that. And there's our coil wound. Now what we've got to do is jam it on this former. Incidentally, if you want three fares, make three of these. And then we just wind that onto the former in a serpentine. And when you've done that, that is what you get. Now on a practical point, you might notice on the coil, I put these little tape bits here to hold the coil together. And in that position, because it makes it a piece of cake, to then put the coil onto the actual former. And that glues onto the red piece that we just arranged so it's at the right distance away from the generating wheel. 
across the serpentine coil we've covered many times before and the electronics we've covered and there should be all of the detail you need in order to reproduce something like that. Now we've made a small hand version that can charge your phone but it's reckoned that each arm has got about 60 watts in it or so so if you're doing this by arm you can expect sort of 120 watts out of it really easily and your legs you've got about 120 watts so with your legs working as well you could in theory construct like a cross skier where you're looking at about half a kilowatt generator which is pretty impressive if you think about it but that'll do about 60 watts or so is something like that when i think of a generator it's this kind of thing that i'm thinking about a chunky bit of victorian engineering you'd love to have in your garage but it works in exactly the same way that every generator works this chunky bit of steel here has these massive coils around it when we put electricity in there it just creates a magnet and it's north south and this is the rotating armature of course it's just a bundle of wire rotating in this magnetic field we have the commutator there and we have the brushes to take off the power there and it's working just like every other generator you've ever seen the electric motor and the electric generator they're like two sides of the same coin in general the task of an electric motor is to convert an electrical current into mechanical force on the other hand a generator converts mechanical force into electrical current so as you can see we can simply rearrange the motor to be a generator so a motor is arranged like this and if we pass a current through a circuit it creates a magnetic field around the wire which interacts with the field of the permanent magnet and that makes a rotation in the loop and it looks like this in the case of a generator we can provide the mechanical force with something like a windmill rotor attached to the loop and connect a bulb in place of the battery now when we leave the magnetic field as it is and apply a wind to the rotor an electrical current is produced now i can't say this often enough but that is the basic principle and of course there's a whole range of different components so coils can come in all shapes and sizes rodan coils uh, normal coils starship coils serpentine coils. there's just so many of them but they are in fact just that bit of copper that you're waggling in the magnetic field the way you input can have a whole range we can have a windmill like in the example or we can have this which is the one that we've done but there's a whole range of ways of doing that job and it leads to a huge configuration but when you're wondering about them they all work on that basic principle including this so quite a lot of the times what you're making is a choice now i like serpentine coils because i have this belief that they're easier to make and they're easier to use and they perform really well for various reasons and i've done loads of videos on that but serpentine coils are my favorite and so we've got this serpentine coil now I'm also a believer in generation at the edge rather than torque at the axle. What means is that I've got this big disc with the magnets on because the speed of the disc is faster the further away from the edge that you from the center that you get. And remember the voltage that's generated depends on the length of the copper passing through the magnetic field, the angle that copper makes with the field, the speed at which it turns and the strength of the magnetic field. That's it. That's what generates voltage and those are the things you can manipulate and so I choose this particular generator design and I'm sure other people make other choices now because the problem with renewables is they're not always there I mean the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine but if you're wanting power of course there is something always there and that's you if you're going to be using you to generate power what you want is something that really is pretty efficient and can transfer your power into a generator as efficiently as possible and as easily as possible and believe it or not this crank mechanism is one of the most efficient methods of doing that so what we've done with it is we've stuck a generator on it and i've also put the electronics on them so do check out video 1981 where we go into this a bit more detail but there's the ends of the coil coming straight into the rectifier right there and then from the rectifier into the voltage regulator and from the voltage regulator straight out into this usb plug that's all there is to it and there's a usb connector coming out of the voltage regulator and i have got my phone right here <laughs> And there she is charging. <laughs> I 
that was amazingly comfortable because I had to do about 20 minutes to charge a few percent on the phone, but it worked really, really well. I understand that it doesn't appeal to everybody and there were various things wrong with it. So what I've done is I've redesigned it into this much more compact version using a more compact gear chain where the chain is actually offset one on the other. And it works in the same way, only it's got one rocker arm on it. So in order to put this together, what we do is this. So here's the machine. Obviously you need to print everything off. Now some of the bits you're gonna need two bits off, but that'll be obvious as we go along. The first bit that we do uses these four parts. And as you can see, the deep pink, you need two of those, and there's only one shown on the picture. When you printed those off, you insert the light pink into the brown and it uses a piece of four millimeter bar. The four millimeter bar is a tight fit in the pink, but a loose fit in the brown, and that swivels. The next bit you're going to need is one of those deep pink, and it goes in the hole, the small 4mm hole, because it's another bit of 4mm bar. You take the second pink thing and pop it on like that, because this becomes the crank, and so it's a tight fit into the crank, and a loose fit into the light pink, a tight fit into the dark pink. Then we take the base unit. Now all those large holes in the base unit take bearings, which are 12mm by 6mm, by four millimeters deep, and there's three of them. I double them up usually to put six in there, but everything is going to fit in there. That unit that we just built goes into the far hole on the base unit, again, this time with six millimeter bar. Now, when we looked at this, you'll notice that the center holes have a flat to them. When they go into there, the flat needs falling off on the piece of six millimeter bar because that's the bit that drives. Then we take this large blue cog, and you'll notice there's a flat on there, and that large blue cog fits onto the end there, again, because that is a driving cog. Then we take this double cog, and it goes in the second hole, so that it sits like that against the blue cog, and that's part of the gear chain. You copy that red cog again, and put the second red cog on, so you can see it meshing like that. Now, in the center of these cogs, you put some um, more bearings, the 12 millimeter by six millimeter by four millimeter bearings. Again, I put two in there in that large hole because when they're arranged as a gear chain like this, what they actually do is spin freely and only mesh with each other. And that's how the gear chain works. Now we take the purple, and this is a small cog again with the flat on it. So you'll need to flatten off a six millimeter bar. And that goes there on that section of the gear chain. Then we take this yellow piece, which is going to be the cap, and the two holes in the yellow piece, again, take 12 millimeter by six millimeter bearings, and they fit against the main frame using the spacers, and you'll need two of those spacers. That is a four millimeter bolt that goes all the way through and fastens the yellow piece onto the main frame. And you've done that, you can attach the rotor disc, and here it's shown without the magnets, so we need to put magnets in those holes going north-south, north-south, and those magnets are one centimeter by two millimeter neodymium magnets, and they're polarized on the large flat face. And there's a small spacer that you need to put onto the six millimeter bar to lift that away from the, the bolts that you put in to hold the gear chain in place. Then we can put the um, serpentine coil. Here it's shown without the coils. You need to make the serpentine coil, as we've shown before, wrap it around there and put that, and it rests neatly in the cradle and glues against the cradle to make the final machine, which looks like that. So I've hooked up a little LED and we just give that a press on the treadle. And there we go, <laughs> it starts to light the LED almost immediately. I don't want to go too quickly because we'll blow the LED up. But let's have a look at the voltage. Okay, so now I've connected it to the voltmeter. I haven't put the electronics on yet, but the electronics go on the same way that we did in 1983. But couldn't resist, so I have put the little feet on because I just love them, hey? But let's get this spinning up and see what kind of voltage we can actually get from it. Did we get Luke? I see it peak at around 
something bolts. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Plenty enough to charge your phone, okay? So we got that up to seven point something or other volts. Serpentine coil, exactly the same size, and it's much easier to use, and it also has its freewheel effect, courtesy of this little arm being nice and compact. There you so, go, the complete build from A to B for you to be able to make an emergency phone charger you work with your thumb. It's pretty cool, I think, and certainly if people wanted to turn this into their own product, well, all the information and plans are there, and if you want to improve it, please feel free, but keep me up to date. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching, and please do remember to like and subscribe.